Hey everybody, Derek here at uh, Lucky Vitamin Headquarters in the beautiful Northeast USA. Uh, it's great to have so many people joining us today for our wellness webinar about mindful nutrition presented by our good friends at Carlson. Thank you all very much for attending. Today we are joined by Jolie Root, who is a nurse, nutritionist, health educator, medical journalist, and is also currently the senior nutritionist and educator at Carlson. Jolie travels throughout North America and Europe attending medical conferences, lecturing and educating the public about the role of nutrition in integrative medicine. So before we begin our webinar, just a few quick reminders. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you after its conclusion. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please enter them into the question box on your screen. So thank you all again for attending, and I'm going to turn this over to Jolie now. Jolie, take it away. All right. Thank you so much, and uh, I, I want to thank Carlson Laboratories, and let me see if I can shrink my... Um, sorry, I'm looking for a place to shrink your window, let's see there, so that I can, what can you see? Do you just see the slide, Derek? We just see the slide over here. That's great. Oh, perfect. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you so much. I, I want to thank Carlson for sponsoring the webinar and also thank everyone at Lucky Vitamin for giving me the opportunity to share this information with you today. And we're talking about healthy diet, healthy mind. There's a lot of great information to share. And the idea is that optimal nutrition helps us realize our maximum potential for everything as far as cognition, mental achievement, happiness, fulfillment, and also longevity, the, the health of the brain at every life stage. So right now on screen I have salmon on a bed of lettuce with some blueberries, a lovely kind of salad for lunch featuring omega-3 and the salmon. Blueberries are featured here because blueberries are a very high antioxidant fruit that has been shown in studies to stop the shrinking of the brain. Blueberries are for brain longevity and there are people at Tufts University that suggest a cup of blueberries daily in order to hold on to brain volume and brain volume is connected to brain function, particularly in later years. So this would be a very brain fit meal, this nice salmon salad garnished with blueberries. What we know is that the modern Western diet, the junk food diet that unfortunately so many people in the U.S. consume is linked to problems with physical health, obesity obviously, heart disease and cancer, diabetes, and things like immune suppression. But what people don't recognize as readily is that diet affects our brains and our behavior. And the junk food diet is a rotten way to feed our children. We understand physical risks to children, but we also need to understand that behavior, learning abilities, and mood is directly connected to the SAD, the standard American diet, the Western pattern of eating, which is a lot refined and processed foods and not enough whole foods. So in the UK, they spend millions of dollars in school behavior improvement programs. In the US, we have unfortunately in many, many school districts around the country inadequate funding to deal with the challenges that teachers are increasingly facing with children that have very high levels of need because they struggle with things like attention deficit, learning challenges, and, and even autism. The World Health Organization expects a 50% increase in child mental disorders by 2020, and autism, dyslexia, hyperactivity, reading and spelling and learning challenges are all on the increase. So the question is, are we still in a period of evolution or have we begun to devolve 
because of the way that we feed ourselves. Unfortunately, the children of the generation being born right now are the first generation in developed countries in all of our lifetimes that will probably not have the same lifespan as their parents, which is shocking. We have been increasing human longevity for the last several centuries with improvements in medical care and improvements in all of the hygiene and other standards of living that we enjoy here in the better developed countries. But because of the junk food diet, because of excessive consumption of bad fats, of too much sugar, of too many refined foods, we actually are not increasing the lifespan. We are increasing the rates of chronic diseases and we're increasing the likelihood that people will live shorter lives than their parents and grandparents, not longer lives. So the junk food diet, particularly when we talk about the brain, was never the plan. We were never meant to feed our brains chips and cakes and cookies and candies and crackers and things that come from boxes. Our brains need whole foods and I really want to get into how we nourish the brain lifelong, starting in the womb, but going until hopefully a long and rosy lifespan, people living into their 80s, their 90s, and even beyond. One of the biggest problems that we see, and it directly relates to having a healthy mind, is that sugar consumption has, has risen so dramatically um, since 1820. In 1820, in North America, and particularly the U.S., we consumed around four pounds of sugar per person per year. And we are now just under 100 pounds. The good news is we're on the decline slightly. We were up at about 150 pounds per person per year of sugar, but we are on the decline. So our efforts in education and the attempts that people that are in nutrition policy and education have been making are having a good impact. Sugar's on the decline, but it's still far, far, far too high for optimal health because with all of the sugar intake, especially high fructose corn syrup, comes obesity, diabetes, heart disease, even dementia and Alzheimer's. There was a very compelling study that was published last year in the Journal of Clinical Investigation looking at whether or not blood sugar elevation was driving Alzheimer's disease. And what they found was that sugar impacts amyloid plaques in the brain and those amyloid plaques are seen in patients with Alzheimer's. Boosting glucose in young healthy mice made their brains produce beta amyloid faster. And if they, it, when they increased the blood glucose, um, it, it led to a 20% higher level of amyloid compared with mice that had normal blood glucose levels. They doubled blood glucose. And that might seem like that would be hard to do, but in humans, that's not hard to do at all. And sometimes when people take a glucose test after a meal, particular high carb meal or after consuming uh, a, a bunch of ounces of a high fructose corn syrup sweetened soda or fruit juice, the blood sugar level can double. Now when the team repeated the experiment in older mice that already had some amyloid plaques in the brains, the amyloid levels rose by 40%. This would be a parallel of a middle-aged or older human who we know that Alzheimer's takes decades to develop and that beta amyloid and amyloid plaques can form in the brain uh, for 15 or 20 years before any symptoms show up. So what the result study showed was that diabetes and other conditions of elevated blood sugar levels like insulin resistance, which is uh, unfortunately an epidemic in our population today, harm brain function and increase the risk 
of Alzheimer's. So the message is very clear. We should, if we really want healthy brains throughout life, eat less sugar, we're already sweet enough. Now the good news is there are nutrients and nutritional approaches for reducing amyloid levels and amyloid plaque formation. Um, one of those is the omega-3 DHA, which is in the cold water fish like salmon and tuna. We'll be talking a lot about DHA as we go through the call and the foods that provide DHA. But the other thing is activated vitamin D, the hormone form, calcitriol, vitamin D, actually reduces plaque formation and makes the amyloid protein that forms the plaques in Alzheimer's brains more soluble, helping it to be cleared. And so when the amyloid levels reduce and when the plaques dissolve, memory and other brain function improves. So what this showed was that the reduction of amyloid actually translated into improved cognition. And so things that reduce amyloid include the DHA omega-3, include the hormone form of vitamin D. And what that means is we need good circulating levels of vitamin D. For most adults, until we get a vitamin D test to find out exactly where we are, it's probably a good idea to make sure that we are getting a daily amount of vitamin D in supplement form because we know that vitamin D can be produced from sunlight on the skin, but when we wear sunscreen, it blocks that production. Another big issue with cognitive impairment in the last century has been a big shift in the balance of omega-3 and omega-6, seen here with things that represent omega-3 and omega-6. What would be great is if the scales were even, if we got the same amount of omega-3 as omega-6. What is unfortunately true here in America is that we are anywhere from 10 times to, in some cases, 50 times higher in omega-6 intake than omega-3 intake. And the omega-3s in particular that are important for the brain are the longest omega-3s, the EPA and especially the DHA. So on the one side of the scale, we've got some salmon and we've also got some soft gel fish oil capsules, which is how a lot of people who don't love eating fish get their EPA and DHA. On the other side, we have omega-6 foods, represented here by the burger, the fries, the pizza, um, Fast foods are very, very high in omega-6. Uh, other things that are high in omega-6 are vegetable oils. And we need to really look at balancing omega-3 foods with omega-6 foods. And I'll be more specific about that with some nice pictures in just a moment. But I want to talk about omega-3 for brain development and function for a second here. Omega-3s were recognized as essential nutrients in the 1960s. And the longest ones, the EPA and DHA, which can't be formed by the body, they need to be taken in through the diet. Uh, the body formation of the longest omega-3s is slight at best. Um, and that's because of too much omega-6 in the diet. Well, the long omega-3s, EPA and DHA, are very important for structure and function of the brain, the eyes, and the nervous system. And shifts over the last century, lower seafood intake, higher vegetable oil intake, have reduced our levels of these critically important omega-3s. So here are some great omega-3 foods. You see the kale, leafy green vegetables, uh, spinach, collard greens, the chard, the all kinds of dark leafy green vegetables are good sources of the plant omega-3 alpha linolenic acid. And so are flax seeds and chia seeds and flax seed oil. To a very small amount, those plant omega-3s can be elongated into the, the more important omega-3s, EPA and DHA, but those more important omega-3s are provided preformed, already formed in things like omega-3 eggs, cold water fish, sardine, tuna, salmon, mackerel, 
and they can also be derived from supplements if people don't like to eat fish. Walnuts are a great source of the plant omega-3, and the plant omega-3s are healthy. Uh, we just had a big study a week ago that showed a reduction in heart disease with people with higher intake of even the plant omega-3s. But the brain needs DHA, so we really need to make sure that we are consuming preformed foods that have preformed DHA. That means the omega-3 eggs, the cold water fish, and if you are a vegan, there are algae-based DHA supplements that you can take in order to make sure that you're not coming up short where DHA is concerned. Now these are omega-6 foods. You see all the vegetable oils, things like corn oil and soybean oil are much higher in omega-6 than omega-3 and so are fast foods and a lot of convenience foods, the prepared foods. So we have to be paying close attention to getting more omega-3, but we also have to pay really specific attention to taking in less of the omega-6 foods. So when it comes to cooking oil, a suggestion that I have is olive oil, because olive oil is more of an omega-9. It doesn't really contribute to that excessive level of omega-6 that one might see with these other vegetable oils. And the other thing that is important is grass-fed protein sources, it, your, your free-range chicken, grass-fed beef, and pork, and veal if you do eat meat, because the animals that graze, that are pasture-raised, actually accumulate more omega-3 into their systems, and so we get more omega-3 from those protein selections. Where omega-3s are very important for brain development is in the womb, and a number of studies have demonstrated that DHA is required for normal brain development in humans. We need it for the formation of nerve cells and their membranes, and when DHA is in short supply, the structure and function of brain cells is compromised. Infant studies have shown that newborns that are supplemented with DHA have improved brain development and they process information more rapidly. Other benefits for babies are that they sleep through the night sooner. DHA allows them to settle. It has a calming influence. So several years ago, infant formulas began to be available that were supplemented with DHA. And that is a great option for parents who are not able to breastfeed. So DHA infant formula is an option, and also supplementing babies with DHA is another option. Mom needs to benefit from DHA also, and the benefits for pregnancy are well established. They include less likelihood of giving birth prematurely. 600 milligrams of DHA is required to most uh, actively protect women from premature birth, and of course that protects the baby too, because preemies have some real challenges uh, when, they, when they're born, particularly if they don't get well into the third trimester. So expert organizations all around the world are recommending supplemental DHA throughout pregnancy and on the average, the recommendation is 200 milligrams daily. That is a minimum recommendation, a minimal amount of DHA um, for pregnancy. And it certainly is fine to take a higher level of DHA. Here on screen is an example of a product called Mother's DHA, which has a 500 milligram DHA and 100 milligram EPA, which would meet that 600 milligram number that I mentioned earlier for protecting pregnancy. There's also a women's omega multi. It's a multivitamin with DHA. It's an excellent choice for women to make to be on a, a nice, potent multivitamin and have it contain some DHA omega-3 even before conception because studies have shown that if the mom is on her supplement from day one of pregnancy, she's far less likely to have a baby 
with neural tube defect and other birth defects, and she's also far less likely to lose that pregnancy. So women of childbearing age need to be on a great multivitamin and hopefully one that provides some omega-3, either that or be on a daily omega-3 supplement. Now, cognitive destiny, it's something that I think about from a nutritional standpoint because we have had a long argument in nutrition science during the whole length of my career as a nutrition educator, which is, is it nature or nurture? Um, is it that it is a genetic given that a child has a certain potential? So, for example, IQ or a uh, calm child versus a very hyper child, is that strictly genetic or does it have something to do with the way that the child and the parents prior to conception are nourished? Um, meaning does nutrition have the ability to overcome maybe not such a great deck of ha uh, uh, hand of cards as far as genetics are concerned? Can nurture, can an environmental choice overcome a genetic uh, predisposition towards something like attention deficit or autism? The World Health Organization suggests that infants be supplemented with DHA, either that the mother is very well nourished and is breastfeeding and passing the DHA along in breast milk, and in that case, that 500 milligrams of DHA would be a minimum amount recommended for that mom through the breastfeeding period as well as during pregnancy. And that, let's say mom isn't breastfeeding, the baby should be getting 20 milligrams per kilogram of DHA daily. So a 12-pound baby, that's 120 milligrams of DHA. That's a great recommendation. The problem with that is in America, Across the board, we get less than 100 milligrams. We get right around 115 milligrams of both EPA and DHA on a daily basis, and one in five of us get none. One in five Americans consume no EPA or DHA. So that means that the average intake across all age groups doesn't even meet the requirement that is necessary for a 12-pound baby of these long chain omega-3s, that's an issue and something that we need to correct. So babies and children can take supplements and there are taste award winning liquid supplements that taste like the flavor, lemon or orange or bubble gum, fruit splash, a, a fruit extract flavor and are not fishy tasting and parents that want to boost the children's omega-3 levels can incorporate those liquids. The child's dose is half a teaspoon, and infant's dose might start at one-fifth of a teaspoon, so the baby DHA product actually comes with a syringe so that you can accurately measure even a fraction of a teaspoon, and that should be on a daily basis, and it doesn't need to even be off of a spoon. It can be mixed into a smoothie. It could be put on popcorn. It can be mixed into anything that the child is about to eat. And because these liquids from Carlson are not fishy tasting, they're taste award winning because they're not fishy tasting. They can be incorporated into something that the child is about to eat and it takes the fight out of the equation. So the mom doesn't have to we all have memories of our grandparents chasing us with a teaspoonful of some kind of cod liver oil, or people my age have that memory anyway. The mom doesn't have to do that today because these oils are very clean and tasty. Now, omega-3 is not the only thing for parents to be concerned about prior to conception. There was a very interesting study this year looking at brain function in children of mothers who had very low levels of vitamin D at the um, 18 weeks gestation period. And what they found was neurocognitive problems, a higher level of that in those children at 10 years of age. They also had eating disorders. There were issues with bone mass, impaired lung development at different ages. 
just because the mothers had very low vitamin D levels in, in kind of the midpoint of pregnancy. So parents who want to have healthy children have to be healthy themselves and make sure that they're well nourished with multivitamins, vitamin D, and omega-3. And there were two studies looking at vitamin D and omega-3 last year and um, the year before looking at how vitamin D and omega-3 work together to increase the production of serotonin. That vitamin D hormone regulates the production of serotonin in the brain. Serotonin is the mood neurotransmitter. Serotonin elevates your mood, makes you feel happier. And um, drugs like Prozac and Zoloft are prescribed to boost serotonin levels. But our brains make serotonin from the amino acid tryptophan, which is in turkey and milk and other proteins. But vitamin D, the active vitamin D, the hormone calcitriol, enables the tryptophan to be turned into serotonin in the brain. Now what the relevance of that is, is that if we have very low levels of vitamin D, and that is something that we see across our culture, then we may not be able to, to, to switch on the formation of serotonin from the tryptophan in our diet. So we need to pay attention to eating foods that contain tryptophan, but we also need to make sure that we have adequate vitamin D levels. And the omega-3s play a partnership role with the vitamin D in regulating the signaling of the serotonin. So serotonin activity requires not just tryptophan in protein foods, but also vitamin D and omega-3. So here is a brain food shopping list blueberries, avocado, green leafy vegetables, rosemary and turmeric are antioxidant herbs that protect the health of the brain, walnuts, chocolate also very high in antioxidants, salmon for the omega-3, and omega-3 eggs. Those omega-3 eggs have the phospholipid form of DHA, uh, which you could get from krill, but it's much more expensive. It's much less expensive to get phospholipid omega-3 from omega-3 eggs. But what about older people? What about if we want to preserve our memory and not become older people with dementia or, in the worst case scenario, Alzheimer's disease? Well, studies have shown that the B vitamins, vitamin E and DHA, support brain function and improve memory for healthy older adults who are experiencing decline in cognitive function. And what they show is that neurons, the brain cells, cope better with aging when we have B-complex vitamins, vitamin E, and DHA on board. Now we know that the risk of dementia is increasing as our demographics change as our population gets older and the risk doubles for, for people after age 65 every five years. What that means is that we potentially are looking at millions of new Alzheimer's disease cases over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years because the elderly populations are increasing and that is an epidemic that we may be facing, and financially most nations are not prepared for this. So the good news is that we need to eat fish because a recent literature review found epidemiological studies that showed that increased fish consumption reduced the risk of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. Eight out of ten studies found that high blood levels of omega-3 fatty acids were associated with a reduced cognitive decline. And blood levels of omega-3s can be measured. A doctor can give you an omega-3 blood test, and there is a target of 8%. Um, and that requires, in most adults, 1,000 milligrams a day of EPA and DHA combined. So it's hard to get that from eating fish unless you eat say four to six ounces of cold water fish four times a week, 
Um, you certainly, though, can take a high-quality fish oil supplement, read the label on your fish oil to see how much EPA and DHA the fish oil provides. So there are some do's and don'ts. Stick to whole foods that are rich in omega-3. Don't use the omega-6 vegetarian uh, cooking oils. Use olive oil in cooking. Eat omega-3 enriched eggs. Snack on nuts and seeds, which are high in plant omega-3s. You can enjoy sardines, salmon, or tuna at least two days a week. And don't um, avoid fried foods. Um, don't avoid vegetables. Love your veggies, green leafy vegetables, and also the bright colored vegetables that are high in antioxidants. Have fruits. Low glycemic, like berries. Well, be careful about fruit juice because it's high in sugar. And grass-fed animal protein sources. Keep that to just a couple servings a week. Avoid cakes, cookies, pies, and pastries. And then pay attention to brain nutrients. The B vitamins, folic acid, it regulates homocysteine, which is a thing you can test for in a blood test. It creates blood vessel damage brain damage and an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Folic acid should be taken together with vitamin B12 and vitamin B6. You can get that in a good B complex or a great multivitamin. Uh, and energy metabolism depends on the B vitamins also. Now you can get B vitamins from foods, boiled eggs, avocado, peanuts, oatmeal, meats, cheeses, are all sources of vitamin B in the food supply. Other brain nutrients, choline. It's part of the B vitamin family. It's a precursor for something called phosphatidylcholine, which helps the brain make something called acetylcholine. It's the memory neurotransmitter, and it supports cognitive function. Alzheimer's patients experience sharp declines in acetylcholine levels. And the brain actually breaks down to supply phosphatidylcholine to make acetylcholine if we don't have it in either our supplement regimen or our diet. So foods that are rich in choline include eggs, salmon, chicken, tilapia is even rich in choline, peanut butter, uh, skim milk, liver, Almonds, broccoli, for the vegetarians, the, the soy protein powder, and soybeans like edamame, um, peanut butter, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. These are all good sources of choline so that we make acetylcholine at levels that keep our brain from having to break itself down to supply phosphatidylcholine. Another really important family of brain nutrients is the antioxidant family. Vitamin C and E, it prevents the breakdown of the lipids in the brain cell membranes, lip, lipid oxidation, and protects our blood vessels. The endothelial lining of the blood vessels helps the blood vessel relax, and that means dilate, and that means better blood pressure, better circulation, when we have that, it provides our brain with the nutrients, oxygen and glucose, but also things like the omega-3s and choline and the other antioxidants that the brain needs. So ACEs, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, and high antioxidant foods. And there are so many, and think colors. When you think about foods that are high in antioxidants, and yes, coffee is one of them, so that's good news for people that love a cup of coffee. Just be careful and don't load it with sugar. Coffee, tea, green tea, the darkly colored fruits and vegetables, pomegranates, berries of all sorts. Walnuts are very high in antioxidant value. Peppers, tomatoes. Uh, the spices, rosemary I mentioned earlier, garlic, turmeric, which provides curcumin, broccoli, and all of the cruciferous vegetables. These are all foods that are very high in antioxidant activity, and they protect the brain. 
Now, there's a really large percentage of the American population that doesn't meet the recommended take-in levels, the dietary referenced intake levels for specific nutrients. And some of the nutrients that are very important for brain function, we're getting less than half of what we need. And almost across the board, nutrients are not being uh, not being taken in at 100% of our needs. And we need to remember that the dietary reference intake supports protecting us from the depletion of nutrients and the diseases of insufficient nutrient intake. But those are not levels that necessarily protect us uh, the way that optimal nutrition intake would protect us. And my point about all of this is that we probably need to cover our bases with supplements and maybe take a good multivitamin. Now, just in the past few days, there was a major Middle Eastern study, the first coming out of Iran, that investigated the link between diet and mental health and found that the healthy diet is associated with a lower risk of anxiety and depression. So the foods that were really specified as meeting the standard for healthy diet were, as you might just guess, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans and other legumes, nuts and seeds, leafy green vegetables, and very high quality proteins, particularly cold water fish. So again, we, we stress the importance of a whole foods diet that offers nutrients in really dense levels. Nutrient density is what whole foods provide. And empty calories, so the absolute lack of nutrient density, is what refined and processed foods provide. So we, we just cannot overstate the importance of whole foods when it comes to brain health at every age, from prior to conception to throughout pregnancy, throughout childhood and adolescence, and then adulthood in every decade of life. So the right foods and supplements improve the structure of our brain cells, the efficiency of the communication between those brain cells, which means our thoughts, our memories, our emotions, makes certain that the signaling all around our brain, uh, those signals are transmitted and received more clearly and more quickly. We realize our optimal potential when we eat a nutrient-dense diet and we take advantage of the science of dietary supplements and make sure that we avail ourselves of a good multivitamin, the B-complex, the omega-3s, uh, the vitamin D, and uh, adequate sunshine, adequate exercise. There are just so many lifestyle choices that we can make that will help to make sure that our children get a head start in life, that they can go to the head of their class, and that we can age gracefully, that we can enjoy life and be vital and contribute to our families and to society in every decade of life rather than experience some kind of unfortunate decline as we get older. So with all of that, I think that I'm just about out of time as far as information to share. And we're going to go to questions and answers. Great. Uh, Julie, thank you so much for that presentation. It was very informative. and. Uh, Make sure everybody remembers that you will actually get this emailed to you as well because there's a lot of great information there and uh, it's always good to kind of uh, go over it all. So uh, I'm going to jump right into some questions that we have here. Um, Jolie, feel free to reference your uh, presentation because some of these I felt like you might have touched on already, but um, nevertheless, we have a couple questions from some of our customers. Uh, one of them uh, asks, what brain-boosting foods might you suggest for babies to help with cognitive development? 
Well, I think it's so important for parents to get babies off to a great start whenever possible breastfeeding for the first six months of life. If that isn't possible, moms should not guilt themselves. Choose an infant formula that is enriched with omega-3 DHA. Um, and the American Academy of Pediatrics also recommends 400 international units of vitamin D for breastfed babies beginning with day one. And vitamin D is available in unflavored drops. Super Daily D3 is an example of one that Carlson makes in a 400 unit dose for infants and children. Um, it's a single drop. There's no flavor. You drop it into something. You could drop it into one of the um, one of the foods that the baby's eating. If mom has great vitamin D levels, she doesn't need to add vitamin D if she's breastfeeding, but it should be checked because the pediatric academy feels that breastfeeding moms are too low and so the baby needs supplemental vitamin D. Once we're starting with foods with infants and, and young children, it's important to offer a variety of foods and uh, the protein foods that I mentioned, the salmon and cold water fish, are critically important for continuing that omega-3 intake, but also high quality carbohydrates, the, you know, a, a, a variety of vegetables and berries and high quality fruits. Um, being careful, of course, to offer a variety so that children don't have either too limited a selection or develop sensitivities because they get the same food over and over again. The brain building foods are the whole foods. Uh, practically any food that is grown or animal protein sourced food will have nutrients that impact the mind of that child, whether it's because of the antioxidants or because of the B vitamins or because of the proteins like tryptophan and the other proteins. Eggs are a great source of choline. I mentioned the DHA in eggs, but eggs have choline. So practically any whole food uh, that a child is offered or a, you know, a very young child, an infant or a baby, is given is going to benefit the brain. Um, so a variety of whole foods, some cold water fish, uh, good protein sources, grass-fed meats. Those are suggestions that I have. And during the formula phase, if mom isn't breastfeeding, make sure that the formula is enriched with DHA. All righty. Thank you so much. Uh, a customer is asking about alcohol. And does the resveratrol and red wine really contribute to overall health? Alcohol is a problem for brain health. It, it small amounts, you know, we talk about moderation, but alcohol is one of those things that a wide swath of our population has trouble moderating. And here's one of the problems with alcohol. I mentioned something about the plant omega-3s, that it's hard to elongate those into the longer chain fatty acids like EPA and DHA. When we have too much alcohol, so if it's yourself, if you have an issue with chronic heavy alcohol consumption, it costs you nutritionally. You do not elongate your fatty acids, not just the omega-3s, but also the omega-6s, and there are some good omega-6s. Um, when you have chronic heavy alcohol intake, you lose B vitamin status, and one of the, one of the big problems with chronic excessive alcohol consumption is thiamine depletion, the, the B vitamin thiamine, and that creates a manic personality and other neurological problems. Uh, and and there, you know, the, the end can be something as severe as cerebellar ataxia, which can have a person be slurring their speech like a stroke patient and be in a wheelchair. So alcohol, small amounts, um, if that isn't possible, None. Um, is resveratrol beneficial? Absolutely. Resveratrol and its cousin terostilbene are antioxidants that are very potent. 
Um, you don't have to drink red wine to get resveratrol. Of course, you can take a supplement. And resveratrol is in the dark purple grapes and in some of the red fruits, so cranberries, for example. But uh, resveratrol and terastilbene, which is in blueberries and available in supplements, those are very potent antioxidants that protect the brain, protect the lining of the blood vessel. I mentioned the endothelial lining of blood vessels, and that's a place where the terastilbene and resveratrol really do their job well, and they provide relaxation of blood vessels, which in, impacts blood pressure, and they are antioxidants that protect against that oxidation of the lipid, the lipid membranes in cells. So I'm a big fan of both of those uh, nutrients, and for people who would just rather not do the alcohol, the resveratrol is available in grape juice and in the grapes themselves. The skins is where you get most of it, so eat the whole grapes, and it's available obviously as a supplement, as is its cousin, terostilbene, which persists in the bloodstream even longer. All right, thank you so much. Um, let me, we're running out of time, so I want to kind of pick out a couple other questions here. Uh, we have a customer asking if gluten is really that bad for you, or is it just the gluten of GMO wheat that is affecting our health? Well, that is a, an, it, that's a well-framed question, so that person is definitely paying attention to this conversation, uh, the gluten conversation specifically, because we think the GMO wheat is probably uh, the alteration in the gluten because of the, the advent of GMO wheat is probably a reason why gluten is a problem for the people for whom it is a problem. Um, for clarity's sake, gluten is not a problem for everyone. Uh, so there are people who, obviously, if you have celiac disease, gluten is, is absolutely a problem for you. And then there are people who are intolerant without being full-blown celiac patients that have a gluten sensitivity, and for them, gluten is really a problem. You can get a diagnosis, or you can do an elimination of all gluten for, say, three to four weeks, and then add back in, and I would do it one at a time, and I would only do it every three or four days, add back in the foods that you used to most commonly consume that contained gluten. So if it's a dinner roll or it's your favorite bread or whatever the gluten food is that you suspect might be causing a problem, it generally when we have food sensitivities, it's foods that we are consuming most frequently that are our problems. So is gluten a problem for everyone? No. Has it become a larger problem? Yes. Does GMO wheat have something to do with it? I bet, I bet it does. There are juries that are deliberating on this. Some people think no. Some people think, oh, yeah. So I, I, I'm in the oh, yeah camp. I, I think that GMO wheat probably is part of the problem. But I also do know that lots of people do just fine with gluten-containing foods. All righty. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one last question. So a customer is asking what you think about all of these packaged foods that are claiming to be fortified with X vitamins and minerals. Well, fortification happened because of the processing of wheat. Back in the day, we used to use whole grains to make flour products and, and even sprouted grains. Um, and when we started making white flour, we started stripping the B vitamins and many other nutrients, the magnesium and other nutrients from those foods. And so we decided, well, since we lost all of that, let's put back in some vitamins. But you never get everything back that was lost, number one. And the fortifications were using synthetic vitamins. So in the case of uh, niacin-enriched flowers, 
they're not as healthy as a whole grain or sprouted grain flour product. Uh, and sprouted grain, of course, is flourless, which bypasses the whole problem of flour entirely. When we see things like DHA fortification in orange juice, uh, orange juice would have never had any omega-3, but now we, we're starting to see some omega-3 levels being boosted in foods that didn't typically contain omega-3. A lot of times that's the algae, DHA, that has been used in lots of studies and is absolutely beneficial. So if you look on there and you see that, you know, that DHA has been fortified in your milk or in uh, the infant formula or in other foods, I'm a fan of that. I think that's a good idea, particularly for people that would rather not eat fish. Vegans and vegetarians who choose not to eat fish, ideologically based choices, uh, can take advantage of the algal forms of EPA and DHA and boost their omega-3 levels. So uh, in that case, I think fortification is a great idea. But the question mentioned packaged foods and boxed foods. I'm not a fan. Uh, I, uh, yes, okay, orange juice or lemonade or something like that, it's of a necessity, unless you have an orange tree, you're going to be going there for your orange juice. But when it comes to other foods, I think cooking from scratch is the better answer and, and creating a diet around the basic foods of fruits and vegetables, um, proteins, dairy products, the, the whole food diet, I just think is not in need of fortification and it is the processing of foods, the freezing and the other technologies in the packaged foods that sort of robs those foods of the richness of their nutrient density necessitating fortification. I would rather see us eating real food like our great grandparents used to cook you know, cooking from scratch. That's, that's a thing, and, and so there's the local foods movement. There are, you know, the, the meatless Mondays and eating at home with your family and making your own food uh, from whole ingredients. That, I think, would be a direction that would support our health. Think Mediterranean diet. Think of the cultures around the world that market more frequently and cook from scratch. Uh, that, that, I think, is the real direction of health. I totally agree with you there, and thank you again. And thank you for all the information, Jolie. A big thank you to our friends at Carlson for uh, helping putting this uh, webinar on. Uh, we're going to wrap this up now. Uh, thanks to all our great customers for attending. And uh, this was a whole lot of information, so please feel free to revisit this webinar again and again. Uh, this webinar will be emailed to everybody soon, and you can also find it by visiting luckyvitamin.com and search keyword webinar. Check out all the other cool webinars that are up there, too. Uh, as part of this webinar, we're going to be doing a special giveaway of Carlson products on our Instagram page, so please uh, check us out on Instagram. And uh, thank you again. Everybody have a fantastic day, and if you enjoyed this webinar, Tell a friend, tell a family member, and help us spread the wellness.